Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello, welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we focus on the emerging fields of data science, machine learning and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can think of us as car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the virtual road. And my co-pilot on this epic, awesome road trip down the information superhighway, as always, is Andy Leonard. How you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? Oh, the plague has come to my house. <laughs> are you recovering, surviving? I am recovering. So this is round two. Round one, um, uh, actually, I guess it's round three now because my first one, my older son got sick. He got the oh, flu. No. And then the younger one got the flu. And now the younger one is has the, a stomach bug. Oh, goodness. It's just, it's just, it's just bad. Oh, so, goodness. Oh. But I did get some toys because I think I'm going to uh, unleash my inner germaphobe. <laughs> What'd you get? I got UV sanitizing lights. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is the stuff. Remember when people freaked out about the ozone layer, how it was going away? Um, I think that happened several times. It happened several times. Fortunately, <laughs> it didn't, um, unless you're in Antarctica. But if you're in, if you live in Antarctica, you have bigger problems. Right, that's true. Um, so the um, it's a type of uh, bandwidth, uh, not bandwidth. It's a type of wavelength of uh, ultraviolet light called UVC C. Okay. And it basically is uh, – the, the wavelengths is so small, it can actually penetrate DNA and permanently damage it. Well, that's not good. No, no. It's just, you should see the warning labels on these <laughs> things. But all the best toys have the best warning labels, don't they? <laughs> oh, my. So I'm sanitizing phones. I'm sanitizing stuff. Like, you know, you can't be in the same room. But it is definitely um, – <laughs> it's definitely something that – it's like, yeah. So this isn't this isn't like a bulb you put in the room and it kills all of the flu germs. You this is a device. They make those. Oh wow. They do make those. But um uh so I have a, a, a wand that you can kind of wave over things and kind of just let sit. And then I have like an enclosed case mm. that you put something in there. Like I've been putting my old, my younger son's toys in there that he sticks in his mouth and I put it in there and then for the course of twenty minutes it it, it doesn't sure, irradiate sure. it because it's not really radiation. Uh, but yeah, it basically nukes wow. everything in it. It's pretty cool. Well, hopefully that'll work. Oh, I yeah. mean, being sick is no fun. We we have we have so far avoided both the stomach bug that's going around and the flu here in Farmville. That's good. Uh, well, we're just kind of waiting for it. It's like, yeah, you know, I got a bunch of travel coming up, so I think it's waiting until March. Oh yeah, that's that's the when it'll hit. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. But on better news, uh, we have uh, an honored guest, an esteemed guest today, a uh, guy I used to work with at Microsoft. His name is Adam Heckman, and he is the Director of Technology and Civic Innovation in Chicago. He has been at Microsoft for a very long time, and uh, I understand that he's pursuing an advanced degree in data. And you know what, Andy? What? Adam is the guy you can blame or give credit to uh, for my discovery of data science. Hey, don't put that on me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Adam. Well, you're welcome. Now, it's whether or not Frank does good with it or evil with it. That's entirely his decision. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Adam was the spider that bit me, I suppose. And then whether or not I become evil right. Spider-Man or good Spider-Man. <laughs> Is like something different. <laughs> so welcome to the show. Welcome well, to thank the you. show. Adam. Thank you for having me, guys. Um, so since uh, I'm not in uh, doing that type of work anymore, what are you guys doing now? Uh, at the What is Civic Innovation? Why don't you explain that? Well, Civic Innovation is, you know, I know you guys have talked a little bit about Civic Tech in your, um, in your, your podcast, um, but Civic Innovation is broader than that. So think of civic tech as people who have skills in technology, developer, data people, designers, et cetera, that want to apply their skills to the public good. Um, they want to solve some of the most pressing challenges in the civic space. 
a lot of times it's focused on urban issues, issues that um, you see in cities, large and small, um, and they want to apply technology to it. So a lot of times it's issues around democracy. How do we build transparency into our, our government? How do we see where our dollars are being spent? How do we get our voices heard? Sometimes it's environmental um, issues. How do we you know, use technology to tell, you know, what's in the atmosphere in what neighborhood. Sometimes it's around access to, um, to social services, things like that. That's civic tech. That's about a quarter of what we're doing. Um, we're also looking at how do you take the skills that are, it takes to become one of those developers, designers, data people, and get them equitably distributed across um, all populations in a city, especially underserved populations. How do we get more girls into the pipeline of STEM so that they become women in tech? How do we get underrepresented minorities in, a, uh, in, an, in an area interested and skilled in tech? Another thing we're looking at is skills-based um, skills based learning. So how do you take people who are um, underpopulated or, or, I'm sorry, underemployed or unemployed and get them the skills that they need through non-traditional pathways, may not be a four-year degree, and get them the skills they need right now to fill the gaps in a city's economy. Um, we're also looking at um, issues of criminal justice reform, which is very nascent in, um, in, in at least the work that I'm doing, and also some work with some of the nonprofits in the city. And I cover both Chicago and Cleveland, which are two cities that have, between the two of them, they have all of the civic priorities you can think of, but they're two very different cities. Interesting. Well, I know that you, um, it sounds interesting because at that, uh, what I remember in the group, that was always kind of that, that, uh, the STEM and the skills development was always kind of on our radar, but our core mission was exciting the populace, so to speak, or exciting uh, people and getting them engaged. So that sounds uh, exciting because you have the opportunity now to really affect people's lives in a positive way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. If you take a look at any city, LinkedIn is, is a really good resource. They have something called the LinkedIn Workforce Report for a number of cities. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at the Workforce Report for any given city, it'll list what are the skills that are in overabundance in that city and what are the skills that are scarce in that city. And it actually changes month to month. But when you take a look at those skills that are scarce, that means that if you give somebody the opportunity to build those skills in a short period of time, they can capitalize on that gap and participate in the economy in a way that would help the entire city. Right, right. That makes sense. You know what was really funny when I when I saw that report for DC? Mm -hmm. What was funny? The report came back that we have too many lawyers. You know, <laughs> did it did it also say, you know, I think I looked at DC once, it said you had too many lawyers and not enough musicians. Isn't that bizarre? That's interesting. That is pretty bizarre. So there was a demand for musicians, not so much for attorneys. Yeah, isn't that weird? It's just it's interesting when what data tells a story. Um, the first visualization that I saw, I think it was you did it in Excel mm -hmm. 3D maps, was the um, uh, public health report on for restaurants oh, yeah, in Chicago? Yeah, the uh, food inspection data. Food inspection, that's it. Thank um, you. I'm actually going to take that. Now I'm, I'm, I'm learning machine learning. I'm going to take that and put it through some machine learning algorithms to see if I can do some predictions on the risk. It's an interesting, visual, it's an interesting visualization, cool. and it's a great use case for why data is important in a city. And here's why. There's about eighteen or 19,000 restaurants in the city of Chicago. And then add to that a few more, um, you know, cafeterias and you know grocery stores things like that there's about 13 or 15 food inspectors so the city has to be really on top of it in terms of prioritizing where those food inspectors go and they have all kinds of secret proprietary interesting algorithms that tell you where the next place should be yeah really Actually, I don't know. Actually, I don't know how proprietary they are, but they are they are very interesting. Are they, but they are secret. It sounds like for 
I think I think they should be. I right. think they may be. I don't know because well, you really don't want you don't want to let someone know that they're going to be inspected tomorrow. Right, right, right. That makes a lot of sense. Doesn't that sort of defeat the purpose? Or maybe it doesn't defeat the purpose. Maybe it gives them a chance to clean up that pile of standing water that's been in the middle of your restaurant for the last two weeks. Yeah, yeah. But I guess they also react to complaints too. Not only do they act, react to complaints, they do Twitter scans. Really. Yes. So they're already if using say, data uh, in production. Oh yeah. Interesting. Tons, of, tons of data, tons of data. They don't just look at the. They just don't don't look just look at the food data. You know, maybe they're looking at building inspect a uh, building uh, permit data because maybe if you're building a building next door to a restaurant and building that building stirs up the rats, you know, maybe that's time to inspect the restaurant. Ah, good point. You know, who knows? Who knows? Who knows what it's doing? So basically, uh, before you go out for a meal in Chicago, I'll talk to you first. How about just looking at the data set? Oh, there. Look at the data set, too. <laughs> but I'm always happy to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Um, so one of the other things that you did was you did a lot of work with uh, co- um, getting the um, uh, some visualizations around uh, Chicago's 311 data. Yeah, that's fun data. And for those of your listeners that don't have 311 in their cities, you call 311 when you have a non-emergency request. So, for example, if uh, you need a pothole filled or you need a, a tree trimmed or rodent abatement or something like that, you don't want to call 911. You want to call 311. So I would call 911 if there was a – I'd call 311 if there was a you know dead squirrel in front of my house. I would call 911 if there was a dead person in front of my house. <laughs> but in- – it's Chicago, so you never Thankfully, really know. Fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, that has yet to happen. <laughs> but that's what three one one is, and the city tracks every three one one request and puts it into various categories, and then you can do analysis on that and see what it tells you. Interesting. I believe it was Chicago that they uh, might even been you that determined that if a street light is out, there is a, a high correlation that uh, crime in that area will go up. I don't believe that was me, but I've read that as well. Okay. And um, I did hear another story about, let's see, what was it? That there was a correlation between garbage can replacement requests and rodent abatement requests. And the correlation there is that the reason that people were returning used garbage cans is that something ate a hole in it. Interesting. Or it's or that building permit, that, building permit use case I just gave you. Right. right, right. If there's a if there's an increase in building permits and it's new construction, you're disturbing spaces where rodents tend to live. Right. So they cross data sets. Interesting. It's just fascinating that the the kind of connections and correlations you can find in data, and it's it was. But you can't take it too far. You can't take it too far. Like I've I've seen um, I was with some students, uh, high school students, and they were looking at the graffiti removal data set. Mm-hmm. And they're like looking at this and saying, well, wait a minute, I've mapped this and it looks like all the graffiti removal requests or or a lot of them are coming from the north side of Chicago. They must have more graffiti. Well, no, they have more graffiti requests. Right. So maybe on the south and west sides, um, you know, they don't consider that something that is urgent, that there are other things that are more urgent, or maybe there's some kind of a, a trust issue with the police, or maybe they're fearful of you know, calling in and having some graffiti removed, whatever the reason is, you can't, it's that old causation is not correlations, not causation. Right. It it speaks exactly to that. You can't make firm determinations on some of these things. Interesting. At least you have to be careful about it and do your homework on it. So what would be an example of doing homework on that? Like what, how can people who are data scientists or want to be data scientists when they grow up, like what, how can you, how can you detect that? Uh, and you know, put a stop to it, or at least limit it, limit that sort of bias. By by taking a look at things like when you look at a map and you see where all of the emergency requests are coming from, or when you do a simple correlation and it tells you these two variables are correlated, any good data analyst will know that that is a starting point. That is that is that is a that is where you build your hypothesis and say, okay, 
th this looks like there's a correlation. Now let's do some more rigorous science on this. Um, let's maybe, I don't know, build regressions, build the scatter plots, blah, 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 blah. Do all the real data science that it takes and do the hypothesis testing to see if there's enough statistically significant evidence to support your your hypothesis. Where in, and you know, considering that you just started with a, uh, with a hunch and with a correlation, you can really see how far this can take you. Interesting. I think you really, I think, um, touched on a, on an important thing is that correlation is not causation. You know, that's right. And I think that's something if that when I did this, my data science studying, it, it really drove that home. When you, a, a classic example of this is um, a lot of cities will track their 911 calls, right? And so you take a look at crime, you take a look at 911 calls and you, it's very tempting to say, this is my crime data. Wow. That's not your crime data. Just like the graffiti data, that's crime reported data. You know, certain types of crimes, domestic, sexual abuse, those kinds of crimes are tend to get underreported right. um, relative to what you what is really going on out there. Or neighborhoods, like I said, in some neighborhoods, um, what is considered a crime in one neighborhood is a minor inconvenience in another. It's all relative. So you just got to be careful when you're looking at data that you're not reading too much into the data. Right. Well, I think that's also important, too, because especially as the police department start using predictive analytics um, to look for crime. Uh, how big of a problem is that sort of bias? Well, you know, it, it, it's a, it, there's a great debate about that specific use case. So, so I think it's safe to say that, you know, in the beginning of an algorithm that you use to predict something, there's going to be some kind of bias. Right. Now, the nice thing about algorithms is that over time, they get more data, they get tweaked, they get better and better and better. And the key is to be able to make sure that you're recognizing those biases uh, so that you're, you're, you're working them out as you go along. Interesting. You'll get a lot. Of, you'll hear a lot of debate on those on that topic on on, by, on algorithm bias. There's a lot that's being written about it. Yeah, Adam, it sounds a lot like uh, continuous integration. You know, in software where we're where we try it, we get close, we find some bugs, we try it some more, and see if we can get closer or if we get farther away. Is that the nature of it? That's yeah. That's base. That's basically it. Um, and with machine learning algorithms, um, the with more data, the algorithms can start to tweak themselves. Now that's interesting. So, can you describe how that works, or tell us more? Tell you how machine learning works. Well, how the algorithms interact it, with themselves. I mean, are there algorithms specifically designed to self-tune? Um. So, well, you have systems that are designed to self-tune, the and, and the algorithms are a piece of that, right? So one of the things that um, machine learning is good at is um, taking the set of data that you have and the set of the data that you know, right. building an algorithm and testing that algorithm on that, and then as you get more data that you know, the more you can tweak gotcha. it. Gotcha. So it's an iterative process, but it's it sounds like it's very manual in, in terms of what happens. That's the data scientists keeps them busy. It's it's very much an iterative process, and it's a mistake for a data scientist to build their algorithm once and then leave it alone. Right. You know, circumstances circumstances change, um, things that you might want to collect. Um, change over time, and yeah, it's always good to to pay attention. I'm not an expert at this, but I'm but I'm trying. <laughs> you are very trying, Adam. Oh, oh. <laughs> my wife says the same thing. Well, Adam, but um, go ahead, Frank. Oh, go ahead, okay, Adam. well, uh, Adam, what do you think is holding people back from breaking into data science these days? You know, there's there's really nothing that should hold people back. I think that there is a perception that data science, in just terms like the terms we've been using, data science, algorithms, correlation, 
causation. I think these are big, scary words that people's eyes tend to gloss over. But when you take a look at it and you say, look, it's, it, it's a lot of this is, yes, there is some math to this. A lot of this is math. And some of this is common sense. And some of this is computer science. Um, you know, you start to break down those those perceptions and those barriers, and it becomes easier to digest. I think one of the problems is that we don't have enough students that are studying computer science um, to get them in the right mindset to study data science. Right. The data scientist shortage is um, it makes the computer scientist shortage look like a completely radically different thing. It's even worse. Exactly. Um, because if you take a look at the jobs that are going to be out here in the next, I don't know, 10 years, you know, 65% of the jobs that students in high school are going to have don't exist today. Right. Middle school and high school. They don't, so, you know, if you think that it's important today, you just wait five years. If you think data is right. ubiquitous today, just wait five years. Right. And it's going to need all kinds of skills. It's not just data scientists. You know, you're going to need to have ethicists and policy, um, people who think about policy to make decisions about algorithm bias and when to apply, um, when to apply things and how um, equitably you're getting uh, your outcomes distributed and, and stuff like that. You know, you need all kinds of people, anthropologists. You're going to need all types of people. So is is that your advice for somebody wanting to break into the field is to focus on computer science? No, they, I think they, they should focus on whatever aspect of it they're interested in and uh, yeah, take, start to learn as much as much math as they can handle. <laughs> I, I was not I almost I almost I, fa I, I was recommended in high school. I got a D in geometry my sophomore year and I was recommended to take what was called terminating math the next semester. And think about how awful that is. Terminating math, this means this is going to be your last math class ever, and we'll give you just enough to do okay on the SAT, ACT. Oh, my goodness. And I begged, I, I begged them, and I said, please, I said, any, any, any of the colleges I'm looking at want four years of math. Let me take another uh, math class. And they said, okay, you can take um, statistics, and if you do well on that, we'll let you take trigonometry, blah, blah, blah. So I took statistics, and I absolutely fell in love with it. Interesting. Very cool. Very cool. So what do you see as the future of data science? Where do you see it going? Well, for one thing, um, I think that as more technology gets put out around visualizing, collecting, managing data in easier ways and, and, and more business focused ways, I think you're going to start to see it that some things that are the purview of a data scientist today are going to be the purview of your average business user in the future. So I think you're going to start to see the democratization of those tools. You're already starting to see the democratization of those tools. Think about visualization. Think about what Frank just said about 3D maps in Excel. You know, Excel is a tool that business people use every single day. You know, now they can be creating these 3D maps. Um, the same is going to happen with artificial intelligence, with bots, with machine learning, you know, with all this stuff. And if you take a look at, you take a look back at visualization, if you take a look at tools like Microsoft's Power BI or uh, Tableau or any of those, they're all about democratizing the analysis and visualization of data. Interesting. That that's true because data visualization used to be a very highly specialized, uh, very niche thing. Now it's um, with the advent of things like Tableau and Power BI, it's becoming more and more accessible. In the past, if you wanted to get a, a, a visualization or you wanted to get a visualization changed, you had to go back to your IT department and say, "I want a query that does this, and then I want a visualization that does that." And then, if it had to change, you had to go back to the IT department. And now you fire up Power BI and just Pick your visualization. Right, right. It's incredibly powerful. And it's just one of those things that kind of sells itself when you kind of demonstrate that, particularly the natural language processing part where you can actually just ask right. um, English language questions of the data and you get a, you get a graph in response. Right. Think about what 
that that wasn't even a thing uh, maybe six, seven years ago. No. I mean, it certainly is an exciting time. So what, what are your thoughts on uh, – because two, two things kind of come up whenever I talk about AI or data science. What do you think the job story is going to be? You think it's going to be what Elon Musk kind of calls the job apocalypse, or is it going to just enable more markets to open up and more opportunities? So I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I, I don't – I mean, there's there's two ways of, of looking at this. There is – the way of saying, okay, there's going to be all of this data and there are going to be all of these people that can analyze this data and do things like eliminate uh, diseases or, um, you know, build the next uh, sustainable invention. And then there's the darker side that says, okay, but what happens to all of these jobs? Um, I think the time is right to I don't, I don't even think that you, you should be thinking in terms of job titles. I think you should be thinking in terms of skills, but the, the time is right now to start thinking about, okay, how do you get the, the, not even the basics of computer science, but the basics of computer science thinking into the minds of students um, so that when it comes time for them to enter the workforce, whether they want to be data analysts, data scientists, computer programmers, or whether they want to be, you know, we were talking about lawyers, if they want to be a lawyer or they want to be um, something else. There's very few things where you cannot apply the CS model of thinking and be better for it. Right. Um, and, ke- and keep it and keep in mind that there's go- that, all, that there's going to be a lot of jobs out there that, you know, we haven't even come up with yet. Right. We don't have job titles for them yet. Well, when I first started telling extended family members that I was studying to become a data scientist, I had to explain to them kind of what it was. And then when I gave up on that, I just said that, you know, it's, um, think of it like a uh, statistician. <laughs> yeah, well, what, when you, when you, when you told them it was, think of it as a statistician and then they, their head started to nod. How did you extend that? What did you, I, I'm curious too. I try to tell my family about this. I too. say that it's it's kind of the statistician for the 21st century. Oh, that's good. And they they kind of were satisfied with that explanation. Jotting that down. Signed, Frank Lavinia. I, I still say computers. I just kind of leave it at computers. That's that's my that's like my mom. What does your son do? <laughs> Something in computers. <laughs> So you mentioned several times uh, the the advanced mathematics. So, uh, what would you recommend people to to study? Because you know, I like to think I'm a smart guy, but Me when too. I took math in high school Me and college, too. I mostly despised it. <laughs> but when I took stats as part of my getting my certification, I, I realized that I loved it. You know why? Because it's because stats is not hard math. It's just math applied to different concepts and if you can master statistics whatever domain you're interested in you can apply it over that domain so frank you know you and i are in the in the civic tech space we're interested in how you take data and apply statistics over um you know er, the domain of social impact right the domain of the public good right um somebody else may be interested in how they take statistics and apply it over the domain of healthcare or the next big uh the next big you know energy source or whatever but if you have that fundamental math background it helps like i said in high school almost failed out of math college took two semesters of calculus never looked back again <laughs> now I, I'm, I'm looking at it and saying you know what um I, re- I really wish I had taken more and not even, and, and it's not even that you're using the math itself. It's that you're using the right. concepts from it. Right. Uh, so, so what it's like computer science, it's the math way of thinking as opposed to the, uh, some other way of thinking of uh, the C like the computer programming way of thinking. You're thinking like a coder um, and it just helps you in any other area of study. Math is the same way. Like algorithmic algorithmic thinking, Alg- exactly will. breaking things breaking things down into solvable chunks of problems, and then coming up with very logical ways of solving those problems, and doing the least amount of work for the for the uh, best impact. 
Interesting. So what sorts of math classes or what's what's in the curriculum for where you're taking um, your data science advanced degree now? Um, I, well, there was statistics for sure. Um, I had to take right. uh, probability theory, um, which required some of the very, very basic uh, levels of calculus. Um, and then I took linear algebra, which when I was about to take it, I read the For Dummies book. And then I got, I got a little freaked out, so I went to the city of Chicago's chief data officer and asked him, I said, and he used to be a math teacher. I said, what is your, uh, what, what's your recommendation for me for taking this class? He said, my recommendation is forget everything you ever knew about math because this is a completely different ballgame. And so clearing my mind was really good. I actually got a funny story. I got a funny That's story funny. about the calculus piece. Um, like I said, I hadn't touched calculus since college, which was... 30 years ago and um frank you and i had a mutual colleague who is very very smart and um her training her background is that she was a computational physicist and i have oh, yeah i, I have a uh, i have a weekly one-on-one <laughs> -on -one with her she lives in dc and she's very very sweet she tells me uh, asks me every uh every meeting you know starts it out with how's school going and when I was taking probability theory, I was saying, oh, man, I'm so hosed here because it requires that you know calculus, and I don't remember calculus, so I'm taking a calculus class at the same time as I'm taking probability theory, and I'm over. And she said, stop. She said, there are exactly 16 things you need to know about calculus, and no more than that. You, 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 <laughs> might, you may be learning in whatever you're taking this in on how beautiful it is and how the limits work and blah, blah, blah. Stop doing that. I said, okay. What are those 16 things I need to know? She goes, You're, you can figure that out on your own. She said, do a, do a Bing nah. search on calculus for engineers because engineers don't care about the theory. They just want to get it done. And so I said, that's okay, what okay. I'm talking right. about. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> so I did it. I went and I went up to Bing and I did a search on calculus for engineers and I'm writing all this stuff down. And I looked down at my paper and holy smokes. There's eight things you need to know about integration and eight things you need to know about differentiation. What's eight plus eight? Sixteen. How this woman had six, the number 16 right in her, in her chamber, in her noggin, be, beats me. But she was 100% right, as she always is. This person in particular, she has a PhD, I think, in particle physics. Computational like physics. That. Computational physics. Right. But she used to work at uh, Microsoft Research, so she's... Very smart and very nice. <laughs> the whole, the whole, the whole is so nice. Yeah, that, that was the team that I was on at Microsoft that had like the most PhDs. I think virtually. I think it was you and me uh, were the only ones that didn't. Oh, and that one guy. I think there was, so. The, there was the one guy who got a hall pass for not having a PhD because he came from the White House. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was Frank and Adam. Right, right. <laughs> We were there for we were there for the good looks. Yeah, exactly, and the humor. Um, there was one thing you mentioned. You said that the city of Chicago has a chief data officer. Now I know what that is, but our listeners may not know. So, what exactly uh, it does a chief data officer at a at a at a, at a city do? Well, for, one, for internally internal to the city, if you think about how many departments there are in a city, and they're all collecting data. And they're all using it inside their departments, but wouldn't it be better if they all collected data and shared data and got better together? That's what a chief data officer does. First of all, the chief data officer makes sure that you're getting the data from the city departments. Second thing that that chief data officer does is make sure that you're sharing it for the best opportunity. Third thing is he's making sure that the data gets out to the public. And that's very important. And it's not just important for, I mean, it's important for transparency and it's important for accountability and the whole democratic process, but it's also important because it comes back to that civic tech community. If you expose the data out to the residents of your city, the residents of your city can analyze it. They can tell you, the government, where the disparities are or where the opportunities to improve are. And they can build the tools that other residents can use to make their life easier. Everybody knows about, you know, the, you know, where's my bus at kind of app, uh, or where's the snowplow at kind of app if you're in, in, in uh, 
DC or Boston or whatever. Um, the, it, but it, it goes so much further than that. You have people who have who care about all kinds of issues, and they have data around those issues, and all of a sudden they're contributing to the public good. Interesting. Yeah, I, one of the things I gave uh, I gave a talk uh, about kind of you know civic data for people who don't care about civic stuff. Nice. <laughs> And you know one of the one of the one of the slides was um, there's a, there's a documentary on Netflix called The Story of Maths, and it's a British show, so that's why they say maths. It always freaks but me out. It's weird that and the way they spell color and favorite. I can't deal with and, that. Anyway, and, uni- and going to university as opposed to the university. Right, right, yeah. Uh, we have a lot of listeners in the UK, so nothing but love for you folks. Love, love the UK, but. Uh, we do love you, even though you talk funny and spell words differently. <laughs> they act like they invented the. Oh wait, <laughs> <laughs> they did invent the language. Um, so um, one of the things that I think, um, before I lose that thought, and I think I might have had that, uh, is I think it, one of the things that's very fascinating in terms of um, civic uh, data is how it can be commercialized or monetized. Um, you know, one example I give is that if I'm if if the city I live in posts permits that are pulled, and I give the example if I'm a realtor, because shortly getting rift out of Microsoft, um, we did a lot of home a lot of home improvement projects. So I spent a lot of time at Home Depot, a lot of time um, um, building stuff and things On like the positive that. Positive side, your deck so, looks beautiful, and it surrounds your house, and I think it yeah. goes all around the neighborhood now, right? Uh, that they they kind of shut Got that it. down, but you know. But yeah, it's uh, we basically have a full back thing, and I think I sent you the drone pictures I took. If I <laughs> um, so um, the one example I gave is like, pretend I'm a real estate agent. Real estate agents tend to be very competitive, and there's only so many people set buying and selling at any given time. What if I uh, real estate agents already subscribe to feeds that tell them you know this property is distressed and foreclosed? But what if I have a clever data sign uh, not? Um, a clever real estate agent who dabbles in data science. And not only do they, they subscribe to the service about foreclosures, but they also subscribe to um, permit pulling. Mm-hmm. So they can figure out before anyone else, like, Hey, you know, this neighborhood, they had six foreclosures and all these permits are being pulled. What's going on there. So if they're clever, they're going to drive down there and they're going to see what's going on so they, to see if a flipper moved in. And then what they can do is they can drive by there one day Actually, say that they accidentally discovered it because you don't want to freak them out that you're stalking them, um, and say, "Hey, you know, do you do you have does anyone represent you?" So you know that real estate agent would be there first, right? And in a lot of things, you know, whoever gets there first usually wins. It's a competitive advantage. And, and, and what did this person do? They combined two data sets, right? And that's not rocket science, or you know. And then if you com- then if you if you scale that ex- that kind of an example up to other types of businesses that can combine open data, open government data with their own data. Think about the insights that you can achieve if you're an insurance company, which keeps tons and tons of data or a bank, which keeps tons of um, transactional data, you know, right. all, a, 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 a credit card company, you know, and one of the greatest sources of data that you can combine with your own, I think is census data. You know, people think of census data as you know counting people, so that you can figure right. out how much money to give uh, to give federal grants to. It's so much more than that. Go to census.gov and go to American Fact Finder, and just take right. a look at all of the interesting um, data sets that they have around housing, education, income, dem- uh, demographics. Uh, it, it just goes on and on. Yeah, some of the smartest data scientists I've met personally work at the census department. Yep, me too. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's amazing. Um, one of the things that sounds, sounds like census uh, <laughs> uh, is sensors. And I know IoT is kind of a big deal, and it's particularly a big deal in Chicago because um, I know uh, there was a project or two where they put sensors in a lot of different places throughout the city. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about that publicly yet? Absolutely. No? Um, first of all, it's funny okay. you should mention sensors because I have a nephew who over the weekend got me interested in, um, in you know, do-it-yourself sensors. So I pulled out the old 
Spark IO core that uh, that I had and tried to get it plugged in and claimed and, and working so I could do my own little experiments. Um, what the city of nice. Chicago is doing is much bigger than that. There is a project in Chicago called the Array of Things, AOT. And what this is, is if you're familiar with the Internet of Things, um, where you're putting sensors on a thing, what if you could take a box that could hold sensors and put boxes like this all around the city and you could measure stuff? So um, that, that is what the array of things is. Um, they have nodes. These nodes can hold sensors and these sensors, sensors can track things. So right now, the sensors are tracking just the, the basics, things like um, temperature, barometric pressure, humidity. Um, I think there's a sensor in there that tells you how many cars are going by and how many people are going by. Um, but let's say that you want to do a study of um, you know, carbon, carbon monoxide in the air or you know, nitro, nitrogen particles in the air or whatever. I don't even know if that makes sense. Um, but instead of making instead of having a stationary place where you put that sensor and then coming up with an agreement with the city to put more sensors um, around their assets instead if you have 1500 of these nodes you just buy the sensors and pop them into the nodes and do your study right now the data right. that comes off of this has to be open to the public because you're using um you're using government assets but that leads to some interesting use cases as well. And so here's one of the things I'm doing. Um, I have some volunteers um, at Microsoft, shout out to Raj Krishnan, who are taking the data that is coming off of these nodes on schools and building a website to let students do their own visualizations um, on that data and do their own projects and experiments with that data and then showcase them for the world to see. So how interesting would it be if you took data on the environment on um, a school on one side of the city and compared it with a school on the other side of the city and did some visualizations on that and, and posted it up there for everybody to see. A subtle, That's it's awesome. a subtle way of creating those that next um, generation of kids that are interested in data. Right, right, right. And I, I don't think I think that's also great because this sort of tooling and such is, is is very approachable. I mean, the Arduino's, Sparks, Raspberry Pis they're they're very affordable. I mean, I think a Raspberry Pi three is the most expensive one, and it's thirty five dollars. Yeah, I bought another um, I bought another Spark, and it was nineteen ninety nine. Wow, nice, nice. And Spark is a type of Arduino, if memory serves. I will take your word for that. I think you're okay. right. And it has built-in Wi-Fi. I think that's why it's a little more than fifteen. Nineteen ninety-nine, and it has built-in Wi-Fi. Wow. So there's a project. Um, yeah, it's it's impressive what can be done, and um, I think the source for data could be very intriguing, uh, particularly at a city scale. Um, offline, I'll, I'll actually I'll I'll share this with the audience. So one project I'm thinking of. Um, Adam's a dog person, so. Uh, Emma the Weimaraner, Love Emma. Uh, who has appeared, yeah, she has appeared in some of my videos as a talking dog. Uh, <laughs> um, she loves to break into the trash. So we have a lock on the trash can, uh, bin that we have. But one of the things I want to do is I want to get a, um, an RFID tag and put on a collar and have an automated lock on a Raspberry Pi that will lock the cabinet when she's within range. So smart. So smart. Yeah. So we're actually looking at okay. uh, at projects around um, the Internet of Things, the intersection of the Internet of Things and trash. So interesting. Taking a look at stuff like um, you know the routing of the routing of trash trucks or self reporting right. uh, self reporting trash cans or self reporting trash dumps. You know, think about the kinds of things that you can do in the space of waste management if you had sensors on those things. Especially when it comes to recycling, right. when you have things like um, recycling bins that have that contain, you know, I don't know, ninety percent things that can't be recycled. Well, is there some some solution with the Internet of Things that can be used to resolve that? You're in the right space, Frank. Cool, man. Sounds like your sounds like Emma's in the wrong spaces. 
<laughs> Emma's always in the wrong space. She's Maybe you should just trouble. feed her. Maybe that would be easier. <laughs> she eats plenty. <laughs> she just likes being bad. Yeah. But um, so I think this is the part where we should probably go to the uh, uh, canned question. So I'll I'll start it off uh, because you're the one that kind of uh, turned me on to this. What what got you into data? Uh, did did you find data, or did the data life find you? Mm, oh, that's a great question. <laughs> Let, let's say this. Let's because I'm old. Um, me and data grew up together um, in the late <laughs> like late. It, we did in the late 1980s. Um, I was a, I was a consultant, and uh, I was effectively a database administrator, and I dabbled into database design. And then I came to Microsoft in 1991, and most of my career in Microsoft was building technical teams. And in general, those teams had a broad set of skills. You know, there were developers, productivity people, infrastructure people, and data people. And I was always sort of drawn to the work that the data people on my team did. I was interested in how data was collected, how it was used, how it was visualized, et cetera, um, to you know, capitalize on business challenges. And then, you know, as the 90s became the 2000s, et cetera, as data became ubiquitous, it became not only the domain of business, but the domain of, uh, of highlighting and sometimes solving social issues. And again, that's what the civic tech community is all about, solving social impact issues with, uh, with technology and data. And when you have enough data, you start to be able to see things that you, like we said, you may have suspected in the past, but now you have evidence and context. Um, and so that was really interesting to me. And I started to see in the civic tech space, people who were doing things like they suspected that public resources weren't getting into the neighborhoods that they needed to get to, but now they can prove it and they can determine which neighborhoods to prioritize and help the government figure out, you know, how to do that. So having this very, I'm, I'm a big Chicago guy. I just, I, 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 I love, love, love my city. So having that very local impact with data and technology was really compelling to me. And as we grow this landscape of data and the tools that we just talked about, machine learning, AI, et cetera, and we continue to make those tools accessible, the more exciting this gets for me. That's awesome. So what would you say your favorite part of your current gig is, Adam? Well, listening to that charming Southern accent of yours is what's what? really hitting me right now. What? What accent? <laughs> um, aside from aside from that, um, I think you know there's so many good parts about this job. I think that the best part of my gig is how much I can learn from people both inside and outside the civic tech world. Um, inside the civic tech world, I've met some of the smartest, most compassionate, and empathetic people I've ever had the pleasure to meet. Um, and we meet regularly in forums like Shy Hack Night, which is our weekly. Um, civic tech meetup and conferences, et cetera. And then the other thing is I've spent a lot of time outside of the tech world in this role meeting with both people who are impacted by social and civic challenges and with organizations, both nonprofit and for-profit, that are trying to solve them. So spending time on the ground in the neighborhoods, getting to know the people, listening to their stories, understanding their challenges, it gives a real human background and context for what it is we're trying to do with data. And I really can't think of a lot of jobs that would have afforded me both of those. Interesting. So um, complete this sentence. When I'm not working, I enjoy. Yeah, being a student. I'm a, I'm a grad student like right student now. Program? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a grad student right now at, at DePaul University here in Chicago. I'm getting my master's in Predictive analytics, um, focus on computational methods. I'm easily the oldest person in my class every time, but um, <laughs> it's sort of keeping me, it's keeping me young. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm taking my time with it. I started this a few years ago, and last night my wife and I were going through the schedule, and it looks like I'll finish in 2022, <laughs> but um, I am really enjoying it. The things I took for granted when I was in college the first time getting my undergrad 30 years ago, um, you know, it's really pleasurable now. Cool. That is so cool. What else you got? So we have another complete the sentence. Uh, I think the coolest right. thing in technology today is blank. 
Oh, yeah, it's easily the that it's, it's something we talked about earlier that the tools that are out there today that were once, you know, the domain of only a few, are now accessible to the many. Um, and we talked about some of the visualization tools, but it's also the analytical capabilities that you know anybody with anybody with a, a computer or a tablet and, and Excel can access. Uh, the machine learning capabilities that can access through business level tools, the AIs, the bots, that you that just about anybody can pick up and do something with. The list goes on and on. I think that is just so cool to see. So we have another question. Uh, I look forward to the day when I can use technology to blank. Was that a sentence, a statement, or a sen- or a question? It's a fill in the blank. Oh, okay. That Sorry, I should have been more clear on that. I am not. I am not. Uh, I'm not a smart guy. Say it again now. <laughs> I look forward to the day when I can use technology to clean my office, sleep for me. Yeah, sleep's a big eat my, one. Eat my meals. Make my meals. Cook your meals or eat your meals. Eat my meals. Eat your meals. Then I then you don't have to cook for yourself. Well, I have, I have I have a wife who happens to be an amazing chef. Oh, cool! So you're a lucky man. I am all lucky in that, and I'm a vegetarian, so and she's not, so she she puts up with a lot. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one there, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> she has a gift. <laughs> well, our, our our last request, I suppose, is to share something different about yourself. But we ask that you remember it's a family podcast. Then I have nothing to say. Ah. <laughs> uh, share something different. Well, I have I have you a website. Tell he works in <laughs> politics. <That's... laughs> well, but that's the thing. I don't think I, I tell my friends that I could never be a politician because I could never run for office because I couldn't. I I, I don't. I'm very thin skinned so I couldn't stand up in a debate where somebody is talking trash about me, and I would just fall apart. I would I would look at that person and say. Do you, do you really feel that way about me? I thought we were I thought we were friends. I don't understand. Why are you saying these horrible things? I couldn't handle it. I don't have I have a thin so something different about me. I have a thin skin. But um, also something different about me. I have a webcast of my own. Can I plug it? Sure. Blogs.microsoft.com slash Chicago. Awesome. The show cool. is called the show is called Big Shoulders. And it explores the civic tech space in shoulder and in shoulder in Chicago. And um, I, I, I've had some guests that are some of the most interesting people. And even if you don't live in Chicago, the things that they're working on um, will just blow you away that there are actually people like this out there. Blogs.microsoft.com slash Chicago. Is the domain still there too? MicrosoftChicago.com? I think it points you back to blogs.microsoft.com okay. slash Chicago. Yeah, and it's an my, awesome stuff. Awesome show. My partner in crime, Shelly uh, Grach, has her show on there too called Civic Chat. Cool. Also an awesome show. So we do have one more question. Yes. Do you listen to audiobooks? Do I li- yeah. Oh, I listen to audiobooks all the time. Cool. Do you have a recommendation for our listeners? Can be technology related or not? Ooh. So I'm, gonna have to, I'm going through my, my audiobook library right now. So here's how I do audiobooks. I, I do audiobooks. I run. Uh, I, I run for distances, and I like to listen to the books while I run. In the summertime, I listen to fiction. In the rest of the year, I listen to nonfiction. Um, I would recommend to our, these listeners uh, a couple of books. One is Naked Statistics by Charles Whelan, um, W-H-E-E-L-A-N. That was really fun way of learning about statistics. Um, a very easy to digest book and not a math book, so you don't have to have it in front of you. Having it, uh, having it on your ears is just fine. And right now, let's see what I'm listening to right now is I'm just finishing the Ayatollah Begs to Differ. Um, I got it because I love that title. Uh, <laughs> And uh, that was really interesting, but my favorite audio book so far has been uh, The Worst Hard Time, all about the um, the uh, Dust Bowl. Oh, interesting. Dust Bowl in the United States in the 30s. Cool. 
So if you're a listener to the show, you you can get a free audiobook. Uh, I believe the domain name is thedatadrivenbook.com. Is that true, Andy? That's correct. Awesome. So the first one's uh, free, and then uh, we get a little bit of kickback. So you can help uh, if you sign up uh, with their service. We get a little bit of kickback um, from them, and uh, it's a way to support the show and enrich your mind. Anything else, Andy? No, I think this has been a fantastic show, and I really appreciate you taking time, Adam, to uh, to come on the show and do this interview. Andy, Frank, thanks for having me. Hey, no problem. Thanks, Adam. And uh, we'll let the nice British lady finish the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen. Become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.